rubbish at the earlier um, in the week um, because we actually are out in September and September is Dementia Awareness Month. And Rhonda Parker, the CEO, in her introduction actually made the statement that it's very important not for us for us not to have the conversation about me. So from the perspective of a person with a dementia, don't have the discussion about me without me. So in tribute to that, I thought it might be nice. This is a brand new release YouTube video that they've actually produced to actually have some people in the room. And so hopefully this will all work. Only for four minutes. is fatal and if more people realise that perhaps there wouldn't be as many jokes about it. I know one of the ladies in that, and it does. It <laughs> the YouTube link is actually there, and I think it's also on Facebook if people are interested in 
and sharing it around. So today, I wanted to provide you some background and context to us developing a WA dementia strategy and building some national incentives and, and profiles that are occurring. Give you a brief overview of some work that's actually occurring in the community. Discuss through the talk actually some synergies with falls. I, don't, I, I actually, the project work that I started with back in 99 here at Charlie's was actually in falls prevention and I actually spent a number of years working in that area and transitioned into the Department of Health when falls was still a portfolio and actually positioned it into a falls prevention network. So we've come a long way in um, quite a relatively short period of time to have a very um, amazing falls prevention um, uh, uh, strategy in place in Western Australia and I think the work that's been continued now is just um, exceptional. Cognitive impairment and quality care in our hospitals and also consider at the end hopefully if we're not pushing for time a few examples of services and approaches to care for people with cognitive impairment. In 2012 um, the um, nationally it was declared that Dementia was the ninth um, health, national health priority. And it's significant because it actually now has the attention of um, our national government, federal ministers, and also the lobbying group that has existed to build that and put that into place has built significant momentum. What does it mean? It also means that um, a significant, it's attracting a much more significant proportion of funding and particularly if we look even at research, it's, it's actually grown fourfold since the early 2000s from a national perspective as well. Um, in Western Australia, we're aware that we have about 2.5 million people um, in our population and about 1.9 million people live in the metro area. So we also actually have to balance the tyranny of distance with our regional and rural and remote communities. But it's worth noting that the Deloitte Access report that was published estimated that in 2011 we had about 24,000 people living with dementia and that that's expected to grow to about 36,500 in 2020. It's also worth remembering that about 54% in Western Australia of people living in residential aged care facilities have dementia uh, and I think that's worth um, <coughs> noting as well. The national framework is yet to be released, the new framework, 2014-18. We've been working, Brian Pearcy and myself, who's the colleague that I work with this portfolio area um, with, we've been working at a national level with the De um, Dementia Working Group to um, develop the new national framework. It's now um, going and awaiting its final sign-off processes uh, for endorsement. So it's got to go back up through um, from the Dementia Working Group to the uh, Community Care and Population Health Principal Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Standing Council of Health. So it'll go through its sign-off processes and then it'll be endorsed for release. The vision really is to improve the quality of life for people living with dementia and their carers. So what does that mean for us? It actually means that once it's endorsed, it'll actually provide a reporting template for the states. So we will be looking at having to describe what's happening now and what's being developed or planned. So that ultimately, and the framework areas that we'll be reporting on actually include increasing awareness and risk reduction, a need for timely diagnosis, looking at the accessibility and care for care and support post-diagnosis. And if we listen to some of, some of the people's journeys and experiences, that's often a very significant point in their lives is when they receive the diagnosis. Um, ongoing care and support, care and support during and after hospital, looking at the availability and accessibility of end of life and palliative care as people do transition to terminal phases of their disease and promoting and supporting research. And I think there's some amazing research that actually is occurring in this space even now. In WA, back in 2011, we actually had the WA Aged Care Advisory Council and they prioritised dementia as a key body of work going forward. So a sub-working group again was developed and Brian Pearcy and I support that working group and this is where now the body of work coming forward uh, will come through. So we report back through to the WA Aged Care Advisory Council which reports to the Minister. 
So the original scope of work was really to develop a, services, a, a mapping and services framework, but it's actually since progressed. Um, we now have a draft document that's about 166 pages and is very comprehensive across looking both at community, looking at individual target groups, and um, looking at our acute care and hospital services as well. But more specifically, we actually have to report against two line items in the operational report, which means we actually have to be demonstrating the doing now as well in this work, as we've reported up through to the Minister. So dementia is an umbrella term for a number of neurological conditions, and I guess it's widely accepted that there are over a hundred different conditions that may cause dementia. We're aware that the most common forms are um, actually Alzheimer's disease. Many people will have a mixed form as well. Vascular de disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. And often younger people will have a frontal temporal lobe dementia. Typically features, um, there are declining memory, reasoning, communication skills, and the capacity to carry out day-to-day -day activity. In hospital, the term we often refer to is cognitive impairment and confusion, of which delirium and dementia are common forms as we see them in hospital. But because it can relate to an array of conditions, a person's experience of dementia can vary quite significantly, particularly with the neurological changes that um, are occurring in different time frames for different people. It's actually the third, also third leading cause of death in Australia, Second, uh, third to, um, so we've got heart disease, stroke and dementia. But there is actually a significant social context as well as a medical one. There, a person's experience is likely to be characterised by change, loss, new challenges and life decisions. The impact on family and carers can be profound and long lasting. And I think they're the things that um, stay with you even long after having had the clinical interface with people as well. Your Brain Matters is actually Alzheimer's Australia Risk Reduction Program and it concentrates on modifiable factors relating to brain health, body and heart health. Interestingly, last year there was some work that was published in the New England Medical Journal by Larson et al and it actually challenged or provides, provided some interesting insight into the burgeoning epi, um, um, increasing numbers of dementia or the de dementia epidemic as it was profiled. That it challenged that although we will actually see probably um, increasing numbers in, dem in demographics actually increasing the numbers of dementia that we have, more recently they've looked at community and population health studies and found that there was actually a declining prevalence and rate in um, people born in the first half of the 20th century. And they pointed to linkages with higher education, a decline in stroke incident in this group of people, and vascular factors, and then looked at a combination of medical, social and demographic factors that were actually influencing the prevalence and rate of dementia in this group of people. So I guess it goes to show that there's some shining hope in population prevention strategies and it holds promise to positively affect dementia in the future. So in WA, we're actually working to develop a dementia strategy and with this in mind, we realise that wherever the contact with the health and community care system, wherever it occurs, that people should be confident that the service they receive will meet their need for information, advice, care and support. Now this assumes a health and community workforce that has an awareness of dementia and a capacity to provide the level of assessment, care and support required. So, as we've been working in our area in in the aged care directorate area, we've often um, spoken to the home and community care team and when we saw an opportunity come forth, we were able to work with the um, HAP unit director and managers to look at the partnership program that is now being developed with Alzheimer's Australia. And this is a key component, so if we're going to focus on a community awareness and a community care awareness, so to put support community care work as well, as well as being able to work with hospital systems, then we need to have strategies in place to support that. 
and this is one. The Community Care um, D Dementia Partnership Project, as it's referred to in the brochure, is actually a program. It has recurrent funding. It actually will target an awareness of dementia across the community care sector, but also build partnerships with organisations and support capacity of staff to strengthen assessment need and the delivery of support to people with dementia. So they'll do that. They're actually in the process now of developing memos of understanding. So they're actually recognising you have to bring the organisation and have endorsement from the organisation to be able to support the workforce with the changes that they are hoping to support and mentor and build. So they're developing partnerships, they're supporting education and training, they're um, holding, oh, they're actually looking at the Dementia Champions Program within community care and they're also um, developing a host of um, resources, in, uh, web based as well as hard, -based, um, hard copy based and a, they've got a big symposium happening in October which will be um, really good for the industry. I wanted to show you this one. The Perth Walkley Dementia Learning Centre is actually um, an Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's Australia Victoria Learning Centre. The um, program is actually part of leading participants, so healthcare workers and aged care workers, to explore dementia through the creation of gaming, through the use of gaming technology. So people can actually explore the experience of dementia. They actually have a 10 metre by 2 metre wall and they can project images that are actually touch sensitive and have sound and lighting uh, interaction as well to be able to better experience a dementia experience. And I guess if we think about what Harper Lee wrote all those years ago, you never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view. And I guess this is one way that they're working with their um, work, their, their workforce to be able to better appreciate the changes that dementia can actually have. And then I've put this one in on purpose because I guess then it leads us to question how do people with dementia experience our hospitals? We are asking a lot of people with cognitive impairment just by virtue of them stepping onto our ward. And I've actually put a link at the bottom which is where this photo comes from and it's an NHS Scottish e-learning document and it is De if, is particularly if you're working in an ED or in a short stay unit area, definitely worth a, worth a look. It's, it's very, it's easy to read, but it really does seem to bring to the fore some of the key issues, particularly around communication. Um, and it's a, a, a definitely worth a look. So in our hospitals, dementia can limit the capacity of a person to be able to engage effectively in their treatment process, but also to communicate their needs. So things like pain, being able to communicate the experience of pain can become challenging. So we are now in the early stages of developing a framework for hospitals, more specifically, that is aimed at improving the care for patients with cognitive impairment. And we're doing that in, in consultation with our dementia working group. And I'll discuss some of those elements as we go forward. But hospitals, we know, can pose greater risks for other patients. They're noisy, they're busy, and they're unfamiliar. And they can lead to further confusion and distress. And I don't know, there was a gentleman, uh, actually a doctor from Boston in Perth recently speaking at a homeless convention. And he actually spoke of his early experience in, he actually was the founding physician of a homeless care program in Boston. And when he first went to the clinic, it had been a nurse-led run clinic, and he thought they'd be ecstatic that they were now going to have a medical officer on board. And the senior nurse actually advised that he spend the next three months bathing feet. Because bath feet foot care is actually quite a significant um, issue for people who are homeless and living on the street for a number of reasons. And the um, words that she used then to follow that, she said, Jim, you need to sit, you need to be patient, you need to be present, and you need to listen. And sometimes I wonder then, when we're working with people who have very challenging um, and complex issues, that sometimes they are, we have very busy ways of doing our business, and perhaps we do some need to look at simple um, strategies around communication and listening. So some of you may remember the green box. Does anybody remember the green box? Yay! <laughs> I still have one at home. I'm just I still have <laughs> The green box was literally.
literally that. It was a box that was developed by the Safety and Quality Council back in about 2005. And this is one of those strategic synergies that I see with falls now coming into play in cognitive impairment. Back then, this was developed and all of a sudden it gave a very unique focus to falls prevention in acute care and residential aged care facilities. It gave us a guideline, it gave us the evidence to support quality improvement practice being embedded in our hospitals. And now obviously there's a revised version which people, if they're working in the falls programs of clinical governance may be aware of. But what's happening nationally at the moment was there's been a push since about 2012, there was a Minister's Dementia Advisory Group and they actually recognised as um, part of a key recommendation of a forum that the standards were a key lever that were being very underutilised. And they then, there was a $39.5 million investment <coughs> uh, into improving care for people in acute care. And this was one of the projects that has come out of that investment. And what they're doing is through <coughs> Anne Cummings in the Eastern States with this clinical, um, with this cognitive impairment project, is developing a guide, a handbook. And there was a draft out at the end of last year. And that, I can see the synergies with this guideline coming into place to position the evidence and support the clinical practice improvement processes very much as we did back in 2005 when we were then able to lever our own Department of Health, Clinical Governance, Safety and Quality um, staff to be able to say, hey, this actually does need to be in the Squire program because it wasn't back then. And so we were able to lobby and effectively obviously get it into play. And supporting this work also is the review of, or as addition to this work also, is a review of the current national standards and how they do or don't meet um, the needs of people with cognitive impairment in our acute care system. So that was the matrix, and with the matrix, oh, you're not supposed to be able to read that, I just thought I'd put it in for people if they want to look back at it later. It maps the person's journey through identification, management and a seamless transition of care and then it looks at the mechanisms to affect change. So really for us to be able to establish the responsive systems, say through a quality governance program, to ensure that we have the skilled workforce, which is what I was speaking um, to Chris about before, and an informed staff, and to enable patient and carer participation. And that's very evident even now in the standards, bringing in that participation. So in developing a framework for WA in acute care in hospitals, we have in draft at the moment key points where we would like to address the patient and carer as partners in care. We would like to further um, highlight the need for staff awareness, education and training. Actually look at cognitive screening. So looking and positioning cognitive screening as a vital sign. Look at assessment care planning, care delivery and discharge of patients. And as fundamental and as a foundation to this, ensure that we have best practice, cultural sensitivity and, a patient, and patient dignity and rights um, at the forefront. So in WA, we actually had over 600,000 uh, 600, separations in our public hospital in 2012-13. Of, of this number of people, over 200,000 were over the age of 65. Older people are core business of it. They are a core business of our hospitals. What's significant about this is that actually one in three people over 70 admitted to hospital will have some form of cognitive impairment. Approximately 20% will have dementia, 10% will present with delirium, and 8% will develop de delirium while they're here with us. We know if we look at our SAT level one, so our serious harm or death incidents, that of set, if we just look at the falls related incidents, of 21 of 61 incidents that they further reviewed, these were directly, cognition was directly identified as an issue relating to the fall. And then again, if we look at the frequency related to falls and behaviour in SAP level two incidents, you can see very clearly that dementia and confusion or disorientation, again, rate mentions there. So I guess if we consider do no harm, then that's something that we have to um, address throughout a person's journey, right through our hospital. Yes, they're with us in points in time, 
but they are actually experiencing a journey from the moment they are either transported in an ambulance to an emergency department, to a short stay unit, to a ward transfer, perhaps to another ward transfer, perhaps to a discharge lounge, perhaps to a gen unit, and then to outpatients. So we're actually, at all those points, potentially increasing their risk of harm. In New South Wales, they actually use linked data, which can link episodes of, of inpatient care to more effectively look at the costs associated with hospitals. And they've, they've made the assumption then that the, it would broadly represent Australian population. But they found in this study that <coughs> on average, the cost was higher when it related to dementia, that the length of stay was longer, and that the total cost for hospital care for the 20,000 old people was estimated at 462 million. This is just in New South Wales and that of which about 35% was associated with their dementia. Almost half of the episodes in this study for people with dementia did not have it recorded as either a principal or additional diagnosis. <coughs> and what was even more I found when I drilled down and read some of the detail, only about 3,000 people, about 5%, had it identified as a principal diagnosis. So how, somehow, when people are coming through, and it probably relates to, to the um, number of people who remain undiagnosed as well in our community, that it remains transparent in our system. So what are our opportunities? I've spoken a little bit about the national standards for safety and quality. Now, as they review those standards, they will have actually a new iteration of the standards come forth in about 2017. So that actually might provide us with some leverage at a national level to look at performance indicators and national agreements back through to our state, um, state system. We have our current safety and quality issues that are in place. So through the original SQUIRE programs and the clinical governance processes that we have in place, we also um, have some fantastic local programs that people continually look at their own internal quality improvement at local levels as well. Local project work, and Chris mentioned before that they're doing some exciting work and new research coming into play around dementia and a local project. Collaborative approaches, as I came here today, I um, was speaking to the, there's three new young onset dementia key workers with Alzheimer's Australia. And um, there's, a, there's something about system readiness. Now that there are three new young onset dementia key workers, Juniper, which provides respite care to people in residential aged care facility, have been able to look at the way they deliver respite for younger onset people because they've had the expertise now come through with these young onset dementia key workers to work together to develop an activity program. But subsequently to that as well, the Independent Living Centre, which provides, which provides a Commonwealth respite rehab service as an overarching framework, was able to joined that trio and now they are actually able to deliver a more targeted respite and retreat style program for younger people with dementia in residential care. And so it's about something about collaborative approaches and um, sharing opportunities that I think can really make a difference, particularly when we're all stretched for resource, time and um, staffing. Premium payments and activity-based fundings they sort of creep into lots of our discussion nowadays, but there may actually be some benefits with activity-based funding. If we can look at better coding in our system, if we can identify dementia or delirium events in our hospitals, they may actually attract higher price, higher price weightings associated with care. If we look at the benchmarks around length of stay and issues around like reducing readmission rates, those types of things, they actually might be really good quality improvement processes that improve outcomes for people with cognitive impairment as well. So I think it's a really important um, elephant to have in the room and it will certainly be one of the levers we look at using when we um, a approach a more system, um, uh, what's the word, attack I guess, to um, bring hospital executives and managers and our own safety and quality team um, in department along to understand that workforce, if we're going to support the workforce, they actually need an organisational support as well. So it needs to sit hand in hand. 
In premium payments, we now have a premium pr payment process in place for stroke and for hip fracture. Delirium may actually have a place in that, so that we can actually deliver the nurse, like there's nursing care standards for delirium. It would be great to be able to identify that those standards are in place and actually achieve a premium payment for delivering that care. So strategies, I think, in, again, in that dementia and the cost in hospital, they looked at specific strategies within that and focused on the need to look at strategies outside the hospital. So where it is practicable and where it's providing a, a, a appropriate alternative that there are prevention strategies in place but also support strategies in place for people to have appropriate care in situ either in the community, in their own homes or in residential aged care facilities. That there are strategies within emergency um, departments that aim to improve the identification of dementia and cognitive impairment and actually have those transition processes um, through admission practices. We explore, continually explore strategies within our hospitals and engaging um, patients and carers as partners in care around cognitive impairment may be a really um, unique way of exploring that. And actually having cross-sectional strategies in place. So things like your transition, like working with a transition care um, process. I, ha I had a discussion with a staff member from Brightwater, who their, Brightwater is now going to be offering transition care placements. And they are very interested, and I'll talk about it a bit later, in relation to the top five um, strategy, in actually being able to have a very transparent use of the top five strategy for people either as they go into hospital or as they come to them from to a transition care unit so that they can then better support the care plan of that individual. So if they've got that added information, they'll embed it and further develop the care plan for them. And environmental strategies. The Dementia Training Study Centre actually, and I think there's still a link to the New South Wales process, uh, to the New South Wales component, actually had um, support for acute care facilities to look at auditing processes. And there is still a local rep, I think, who can link and support those types of strategies. Um, but I guess it comes down to starting, probably also starting local with um, environmental strategies. So what do we have? We have people power. And I was flicking through presentations the other day and came across one from Casey Hospital. And, what, and I, I had it in, but I took it out because I wasn't sure if I was allowed to have their photo on um, without having the opportunity to ask for their approval. But they have just, they have gone through over a few years a dementia education and awareness program with their staff. They've trained 700 staff and I think they've got about a 234 bed hospital um, uh, facility. And uh, their first slide is all of the staff standing out front of the hospital. And I just thought that really does give you a good indication. But they own their project locally, they looked at the principles, they actually did some needs assessment work and they put some strategies and education into place to achieve um, what they had set out to do. Where the process through clinical, through the original Squire process, gave us some earlier iterations of falls risk management tools, and now we have the new and revised version of the falls risk assessment management plan. And what I think is quite um, great to see is a consistency around the screening tool that is on the front page of this. What I also really like, and I can't point to it, but is the ability to talk to people about their falls education. Now, where it ticks unable, this is where I really think we need to look at enabling. Because what is it about being unable to talk to that person about their falls risk? That, um, and for some people, obviously, it may not be a, possible with the individual, but it might be with a carer. So it's about how we can enable the discussions that we have with them. And then further, obviously, the next pages look at the assessment and the management techniques that we can put into play. So with an example, just come through this is the old slide, there was another one. CHOPS um, is a, a confused, hospitalized, confused hospitalized older persons program that was developed in New South Wales. And 
it actually had had a pilot program developed and it's since picked up some nation, national funding through the NHMRC Cognitive Decline Partnership Centre. And they're rolling it out now across several sites in New South Wales, um, built on the key lessons from the original CHOPS pro, um, pilot that took place. <coughs> and they're actually looking at expansions into other states. And I think WA and South Australia have even earmarked for that into the future. When I've looked at the updates so far, the 13-14, and 14-15 period really is focusing on New South Wales. So hopefully we may see some opportunity in the next year and a half come forward with this type of program. But the key principles really look at cognitive screening. So a bit of a revision again of what we were looking at earlier. Cognitive screening, risk identification and prevention strategies, assessment of older people, management, communication. Um, and that features quite significantly. Staff education on caring and also in, in ensuring that we have supportive care environments in place for older people with confusion. Now, the program itself doesn't mandate this is how you do it. What it does is it allows local areas to look at the key principles, do their needs assessment and look at how they can actually improve the quality of care for people based on these key principles. And then top five, which I referred to earlier, it's really a, it's a strategy that's incorporated into the CHOPS program. I might just grab my, because I want to. But it came through, again, in um, the um, Central Coast Local Health District in New South Wales. And they looked at a strategy to be able to better document carer participation with their um, loved one in hospital. And they, they recognise that for people who are confused, they have memory problems and communication difficulties, that it's really imperative to talk to the carer, obtain information, personalise the care plan and document the care plan. And so the top five is actually then a medical record document that you work with the individual and the carer to support because what it does then is it allows the carer to share information around establishing routine and personal preferences work with objects of significance for that individual, the must-haves, he must have this, if not, the words or actions that might calm the person, and also information that can assist with communication. Um, and it was interesting, last week, uh, Sir David Dalton presented on the reliability and quality health systems, and he spoke of an incident where a young man had actually died in their hospital, and it was directly related to the fact that the walk that that the actual outcome of the review was that they hadn't listened to his mother. His mother had several times tried to erase her um, recognition that there was something, something desperately wrong and that that hadn't been listened to. So there's something quite significant about being able to partner with the people who know them best to better deliver care. And so I guess I'll challenge us all in in reviewing what's in our toolbox. Sometimes I kind of reflect on aged care, um, the aged care skill set, and when you ask an aged care worker what it is, they sort of just say it's good general basic care. But there's something that you carry around every day in your toolbox that actually makes it a bit more than that. So it's something about your experience, your skill set, your education and training, and your interests that I think really drives at an individual level. So if we've gone strategic with what things can happen, we look at our program levels, we look at the individual's experience. And one of the researchers in the UK, a gentleman by the name of Mike Nolan, talks about relationship-centred approach. And it's about the relationship and the connectedness that we have as well as staff. And that, that actually then creates a conducive environment to have that therapeutic interface. Alzheimer's Australia actually do conduct sessions of education and training that are free to acute care staff. So if you have a look at their website, I think they do about a three hour session and I've done that one and it's very good and then a full day session. So if you do have a passion or an interest there, it's very worthwhile a look. And I didn't want to, when we first started talking about this today, I didn't want to come in and do a session on cognitive impairment and falls specifically. I think we have some key experts 
and I think a lot of you are building that expertise yourself in understanding. But certainly the DB Mass Symposium recently, um, Tony Pedder and Sue Kitchen have actually presented at that, and that's actually available online with a number of the actual live presentations from that, that day that was specific for acute care. The WA Centre for Health and Ageing, the Dementia Training Study Centre as well, uh, Henry Bradati um, does a great um, online presentation there around falls and acute care too. So I guess as you go through your journey, if you're anything like me, I find myself YouTubing late at night and I've introduced myself to this wonderful OT in Florida. Her name's Tepa Snow, Tepa Snow. She's great Florida, like she's got this great Florida accent. But the um, ability, then I just find I go off on a journey. And hopefully if you um, do that yourselves, you'll find that it really is a journey. So thank you. Thank you.